All right, great. So uh, this talk is about uh, the, the OVS kernel API. Uh, there's been uh, various different talks over the years from uh, some of you in the audience and, and various other people about how the uh, OpenV switch uh, user land works and how the OpenFlow interface and so on are, are exposed. Um, but in terms of what's actually available in the kernel API, uh, that's been less well covered. And uh, I've had a few discussions with a few people in the community uh, lately, and, and there's maybe um, uh, it's not always clear to people what, what it is that the kernel API provides uh, in, in fitting within this uh, OVS uh, community. Uh, so what I want to cover today is uh, some of the motivations behind the kernel API that we have for Open vSwitch. Uh, the description about what it is that we provide in that API. Uh, and then to describe some of the different use cases and some of the different uh, user land implementations that exist which are using this OVS kernel API. Uh, so why Open vSwitch minus Open vSwitch is kind of a uh, confusing title. Uh, so uh, for those who are familiar with uh, Garfield, there's actually a, a sort of spin-off or uh, other Garfield uh, comic called Garfield minus Garfield. Um, so this guy basically takes the, uh, the Garfield comics and then he strips Garfield out and he strips out all the other characters and, but he leaves John Arbuckle in there. And so John is this like suburban American thinker. He's very, very thoughtful, very deep. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting comic. Uh, I think it really stands alone as a separate sort of contribution to the comic space. I think it's quite, quite cool. And uh, I would argue that maybe like OVS kernel module without the OVS user space also stands alone as a, a useful contribu contribution to the Linux kernel. Uh, so uh, just briefly, here's the comic where John learns about network virtualization. Um, so uh, network virtualization is, is one of the use cases that, that really comes in uh, when you start to talk about OVS. So we want to be able to logically separate uh, different sets of traffic, maybe guide them between VMs or containers. Uh, and, and this behavior is defined based on some sort of a global view of the network. Um, and we were talking about Open vSwitch. You couldn't really throw a stone very far without jumping onto uh, software-defined networking. So, Briefly talking, uh, software-defined networking defines uh, that there should be some sort of a global view of the network, um, as opposed to a sort of just distributed algorithms approach where every single box in the network builds up the entire state of how uh, the network looks and then makes forwarding decisions based on that. Uh, rather, software-defined networking says that there is some logically centralized controller that has maybe an omniscient view of the network and is able to make decisions uh, based on that sort of model. Uh, and this is really coming from sort of a software world where we're trying to push uh, the features at for perhaps a faster rate uh, than is otherwise possible. So some of the problems that they're trying to solve, I mentioned network virtualization. Uh, there's also uh, lots of different uh, cool stuff that Google's doing uh, around link utilization improvements uh, and various other things, uh, and, and perhaps uh, traffic prioritization. Um, but uh, this talks about the kernel API, so, so I want to slowly uh, transition towards there. So, so how do we get to a point where we can do this uh, cool software-defined networking stuff? Um, and I want to focus on these on the right-hand side of your, the slides there, the arrows that come down from the centralized SDN controller uh, defining what the, each individual device on the network um, is trying to do. So, Flows is really the, the abstraction that we use in the OVS um, world to, to describe things. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is classify some, some set of uh, constraints around a set of packets and then do something with those. So you might call this like the, the match action abstraction. Uh, and, and when I talk about flows here, I'm not talking about necessarily like a, a connection, like a five tuple or something like that. Uh, what I'm trying to define is some broader concept of just uh, all of the possible matchable fields, and this may be pa uh, fields within the packet, and maybe metadata such as the, the incoming port or uh, uh, information that comes from a tunnel uh, or even from another subsystem in Linux or, or this kind of thing as well. Uh, so, so briefly, like. If you were to look at every single possible field in the packet that you can look at, you get a lot of uh, granularity in terms of how you can determine your forwarding behavior. Uh, and with that comes a lot of power, a lot of ability to guide your traffic differently uh, 
uh, based on those headers. Um, but then you do have to consider the performance uh, implications of looking at all those extra headers um, and, and how that is actually going to affect your forwarding performance. Uh, so ideally what would happen is we could take you know, one pass through the packet, we figure out what we need to, to know, uh, do some lookup and, and determine our forwarding behavior, and then uh, forward our traffic on. Um, so that's maybe one of the goals that uh, I hope that um, I can show that we achieve in, in some level. Uh, so moving from the more abstract sort of this is what I'm, I'm saying a flow is uh, to, to how we actually implement this and, and, and get this use, uh, working within the Linux kernel. Uh, so I think the, the vast majority of network policy as defined in the uh, Linux kernel is, is defined through Netlink uh, families, whether it's the, the generic or the ones that existed before that. Uh, and so the, the obvious kernel API is defined in terms of a set of generic Netlink families uh, so firstly, we have uh, some, some definition of a shared flow table uh, resource. Uh, we call this uh, the, the data path. So this uh, applies a bounding box around how exactly our forwarding behavior is defined, and, and it gives a hook point for where other things can, can hang off. So you've got one place uh, uh, that defines the, all of the behavior for that, uh, for that particular instance. And, and obviously, we have to be able to connect ports uh, into this data path in some way for, uh, for receiving and transmitting the packets. Uh, and, and then we come into this sort of flow uh, concept that I, I defined just before, where we want to be able to uh, perform some sort of match uh, on packet fields and metadata, and then perform some sort of actions on that. And so uh, we, we have a, a Netlink family that uh, describes um, what this format actually looks like and how you can configure it. And finally, you have to have some sort of way to describe what happens when the, the flow table is empty. And maybe this is a, a, a little obvious, but um, it needs to be there, and, and it's an important part of the Netlink API. So uh, first up, the, the data path family. Uh, this Netlink family for, for OVS allows you to instantiate a particular data path, so that's a logically separate flow table. Uh, it includes a... Uh, a a data path, a, a network net device that is named the same as the data path. Uh, so this is similar to when you, you create a, a bridge, a Linux bridge, you go add bridge, and it creates a, a device that's named the same as that, device, uh, as that bridge. Uh, and then you can hang off uh, IP addresses off of that. Uh, it gives access to the stack, um, basically calling like uh, netifrx. So for a particular data path, we have a single flow table uh, we associate one or more ports. Uh, there has to be at least the data path device. Uh, and then the zero or more flows to determine how our, our, flow, our packets will actually be forwarded. So moving on, there's the uh, virtual port family uh, in, in the Netlink uh, API. This allows you to attach a device to that uh, data path uh, existing in the kernel. Uh, so there are various different types of ports that you can add. Uh, so the vPort internal is, is the same as, as the um, uh, bridge device, but you can actually add additional uh, internal devices to the bridge uh, if that makes sense for your use case. Um, obviously, you can attach like just your regular net devices. Uh, there's also these uh, tunnel virtual ports. So previously, uh, we, you know, we've had uh, Geneve and VXLAN and GRI. Uh, ports for this in the kernel. Uh, this was built on um, something similar to what uh, Lightweight Tunnels now achieves. And uh, over time, we, we are transitioning uh, these over to use the uh, Lightweight Tunnel infrastructure. Moving on to the flow family. So this is where the, the interesting stuff, stuff starts to come in. So from user space, you can configure some set of fields, uh, and these are defined in the API, uh, to match on and then some set of actions to, to, uh, to execute. So in the, uh, the blue or cyan here, uh, we've got a match, and we're matching on some, some port. We're saying we want to match on ARP traffic. Uh, and then we want to output to, to a different uh, port on the device. And so when we in insert this into the, uh, into the kernel, uh, we can specify, yes, this, this key of the packet fields and, and metadata that we want to match on. We have the actions of what to ex uh, actually execute. Um, output is the the most obvious basic case, but there's obviously uh, the, you want to munge the packet in some way. You may want to resubmit it to another subsystem. There's, there's various other actions that can be executed. Uh, 
Uh, and then we have this uh, concept of a flow mask, which I'll, I'll go into in a bit more depth in, in, in a little bit, but this allows the granularity of the flow to be, uh, to be managed and, and to make a more abstract uh, flow that, that covers multiple different um, uh, flows. And then there's also a, a, an identifier in there that uh, allows you to more efficiently manage uh, information or, or dump information from the kernel. And there's a few other pieces that, are, that I've uh, sort of glossed over here. So we look at how this uh, lookup actually happens in, in OVS. So what we do is we take the packet uh, from the NIC, we extract all the fields that we know about from that packet, uh, Ethernet, IP, whatever, uh, whatever have you. Uh, and then when we have this uh, full key of all of the possible fields that we know about, we do a hash across that, and then we do a lookup in our flow table, and then we hit and we see, okay, here's the flow uh, th that describes what we should actually execute on this packet. Now, I mentioned before there's this mask concept. So if you were to separate all of your traffic out into uh, the, the fully matched um, all possible fields you ever know about and any possible value of this, then you're going to end up inserting a, a large number of flows into the, uh, into the kernel. And uh, most likely, this is going to have some sort of a, a performance impact. And so this is where the mega flows came in. Um, so put simply, we want to be able to group a set of flows together, and we create this, this mega flow. Uh, then when we actually uh, do a lookup, for any of these uh, packet descriptions on the left-hand side, they'll be able to find the same entry in the flow table. Uh, and the, the mega flow here is based on a arbitrary bit mask across the full uh, extracted key. So if we look uh, again at uh, the, the lookup, it's, uh, this is actually how it works in, in, in OVS today if you insert uh, masked, uh, masked flows. So the step number one is the same. I'm calling it the unmasked key now. So this is all of the possible fields that we could know about for this particular packet. Uh, then we iterate through a set of uh, masks that exist in the flow table. And for each of these masks, we will apply that mask across the uh, unmasked key, and we end up with this masked key. In fact, this says that we're going to zero out the bits that we're not interested in matching on for e executing this particular uh, flow. And when, once we have this masked key, we can hash across that and do our lookup and find our flow and, and eventually execute the actions. Uh, yeah. So what happens when it misses? Uh, so in this case, again, step one, same, we're extracting this key. I've abstracted out the, uh, the, the masked lookup. It's not really relevant to this point. So at step number two, we're saying we did our lookup in our flow table, but it actually misses. There's no entry in the flow table to, de to determine what the packet forwarding behavior should be. So what I'm doing here is uh, we define this upcall uh, structure, which includes the packet, includes the metadata about uh, where we're executing, what we've done to the packet, and so on. Uh, this includes things like the flow key that we have on the left-hand side. It may include other uh, information as well. Uh, and then what we do is we send this out to a Netlink socket so that user space can then determine what it's going to uh, do with this flow. And uh, this, this Netlink socket, it can actually be configured to be zero. So if you want to have a default drop and don't have a user space daemon sitting, uh, sitting around uh, to handle all of this, you can, you can also configure it, configure it in that way. And just briefly, the, um, uh, the, uh, so the, the flow gets uh, normalized when we send it up. Sorry, the packet gets normalized. So we, we push in the accelerated VLANs. We um, complete checks on partial and, and segment the GSO and so on. So that up call comes up to the user, uh, user land uh, process. We have some sort of uh, SDN controllery thing that determines what it is we want to do with these packets. Uh, so in the immediate case, it's about uh, what do we do with the current packet? Uh, how do we execute it? So we send down a down call back down to the kernel, and we say, execute this set of actions on this packet. And here's maybe a bit of metadata that will help you to do that. And then, of course, we've got the flow install that we've got before, because if we don't install a flow, then all of the traffic would always be forwarded through the user space. So if we can, we generate the, the most broad flow to insert into the, uh, into the kernel so that the widest set of traffic will be covered by that, and then um, the future traffic will all be executed directly in the kernel, no user space necessary. <laughs> 
Uh, and so the, the execute piece, uh, it's fairly straightforward. It comes down from, uh, from user land, uh, contains these pieces. We use the metadata and the actions to execute on that packet. And then presumably, we send that packet out to the, uh, uh, on the wire. So briefly, we described the, uh, the data path family that allows uh, the shared flow table, the access to the, to the networking stack, to, to routing, and so on. Uh, it's a place to hang ports. We, ha we have these virtual ports that we can configure. And we have the, uh, the flow family to, to describe what we should do, and the packet family that, that allows user space to, to find out what kind of traffic we're getting and to populate this uh, flow table. So there's a few notable improvements that have, that have occurred over the years. Um, so I, I mentioned Megaflows already. Uh, I'll go into e each of those uh, briefly. So Megaflows uh, basically allowed us to significantly increase our performance while decreasing the amount of CPU that we use to actually get that. Um, and so this example is from the, uh, the design and implementation of OVS. It's a paper we put out in NSDI a couple of years ago. Uh, the, the flow table is relatively simple. It handles ARP and a couple of uh, IP matches on particular IP addresses, and then a, a flow to match on TCP with some L4 port matching as well. So with a naive implementation without Megaflows, we were generating something like a million different flows in the kernel. Um, but then with Megaflows and also with some, some sensible optimizations in the user land process, we were able to drive up the number of masks and, and cover those, uh, that traffic far better and then basically end up handing all of our traffic in the kernel. Uh, and standard disclaimer applies that your software or hardware might get different numbers. There's more details in the paper. Um, so the upcall, uh, the upcall me mechanism doesn't have to use just one netlink socket. So a lot of the, the users use multiple netlink sockets and basically use the SKB hash to hash across and select one of those uh, sockets to actually send the packets up to user space. Um, so this is primarily for like performance. For, so multi-threaded user space program can handle uh, these upcalls in parallel, uh, and then. There's also sort of a side case, which is if there's one particularly malicious um, uh, flow, then it will end up getting hashed to a single netlink socket and uh, hopefully won't affect the, uh, the others. Um, Contract is, is some work that we've done over the last couple of years to, to integrate with the NetFilter subsystem. Um, so uh, what, we, what we have is uh, uh, in our uh, flow there in the, in the blue, we have an action which is Contract or CT, and what this does is submit to the, the NetFilter subsystem, and then once the NetFilter is, is done uh, doing the connection tracking, it, it resubmits back into the um, actions list executing an OVS, and then we can continue processing, uh, but with more metadata, more knowledge about uh, what this connection actually is. Um, Useful also with this is the recirculate action. And so this allows us to reclassify the packet. So once we've submitted to the, the connection tracker, it provides uh, information such as uh, whether this, this connection is new or established. Uh, it may provide some marks and labels and other uh, metadata. And so we're able to uh, reclassify that packet based on that new metadata um, and uh, execute that. So I want to move on into uh, some of the different users of the kernel API. Uh, this is going to include uh, some of the CLI tools that we have with OBS. Um, I, I obviously have to mention uh, Open vSwitch as well. It's, it's the primary user uh, that, that we're uh, working on. Uh, but then there's also several other users uh, from the open source community. Uh, and I'm not going to even try to, to cover uh, the various people that are using it uh, beyond that. So quickly, um, so from the CLI tools, uh, so here's like a, a brief example of how to get started with OVS without actually running uh, the OVS user space, OVS vSwitchD process. So you don't need a user space daemon sitting and, and managing all of your flows. If you know exactly what your forwarding behavior is, is doing, then you can, you can configure it uh, like this. And uh, briefly, I want to mention uh, Aaron Knoll put out a blog post a couple of days ago uh, that goes into a bit more detail on, on how these CLI tools work. Um, and, and goes through some examples. But uh, you know, I mean, we're loading the module. We have this obvious DP cattle add DP, uh, add data path command uh, that follows the, uh, the data path description that I had before. Uh, and then we can use add if to add an interface to that OVS uh, data path. Then on the right-hand side, I've got this like, simple example of OVS DP cattle show. That gives some like, high-level view of what's going on in the OVS kernel module right now. So I've got this uh, my DP 
uh, data path that we've configured on the left. Uh, I guess in this example, I actually had uh, a bit of traffic flowing through that. Probably it was connected to the Linux stack. It was sending some like IP6 neighbor discovery or something. Um, and so all that traffic actually ended up getting missed and lost because we've got a default drop when it's uh, configured via, via OVSDP cattle. And finally, you can see that the, there's the port zero that has my DP internal port, as well as the ports one and two, uh, which we configured uh, on the left. Uh, and so here's uh, some basic examples about the, uh, the flows. So we can add some flows that match on ARP, uh, some flows that matching on some ICMP. Obvious DP kettle dump flows will tell you actually what the flows are that are existing in the kernel and will provide you statistics around packets and bytes and so on. And so this is a really helpful debug tool once you've configured OVS to be able to uh, determine what the, what the traffic is actually flowing through, um, through the kernel module. Moving on, uh, so OpenB switch is the uh, most well-known user. There's an open source community around it. We support Linux platform. We have a DBK implementation. We have Hyper-V, and we're also supporting to, to BSD. So uh, it's sort of a, a wide range of, of platforms. Uh, it's actively maintained and supported. Um, it really what the, perhaps the main point of OVS, it, or the Open vSwitch daemon in user spaces, is that it compiles OpenFlow and OVSDB down into this uh, OVS Netlink API. So it provides virtual switching. Uh, for containers and VMs, and it's also used as a forwarding agent on hardware, but it is primarily targeted at the uh, software use cases. Midonet is uh, another project which uses the OVS kernel module API um, without actually using the Open vSwitch user space. And Midonet is targeted at a lot of OpenStack sort of use cases. Uh, you can configure your virtual routers, your, your tenants, um, and, and how those all connect through the uh, OpenStack APIs. That will boil down into the Midonet agent, which will actually insert uh, data paths and, and, and flows and so on in the OVS kernel module to, to forward your traffic across that fabric. So this is probably a bit more like an HDN application. Um, uh, yeah, solving sort of OpenStack use cases. Uh, WeaveNet is another one that's uh, quite interesting. This is targeted more at, at container environments. Uh, what they do is uh, set up a VXLAN tunnel mesh uh, across uh, various different hosts to connect the containers together, and they set up some, some flows in OVS to be able to connect all that uh, forwarding together. Um, yeah. Indigo Virtual Switch is another uh, virtual switch um, put out by the, uh, the um, Floodlight uh, community. Uh, and so again, this is uh, maybe in similar, similar in a lot of ways to what the uh, Open vSwitch daemon uh, tries to achieve, but it's a, a bit more focused on the uh, uh, hardware platforms. Um, so they've got it for bare metal switches there as well. So some of the common threads that I've noticed with the, uh, the different users of the Open vSwitch kernel API, uh, they're trying to integrate well with some of the other uh, subsystems and so on in the community, uh, sorry, in, in the Linux uh, code base. So, I mean, we always make use of uh, uh, lightweight tunneling. Uh, in OVS, we're, we're integrating with the NetFilter subsystem for all the connection tracking. Um, when you look at something like WeaveNet, they're uh, applying um, IPsec uh, and XFRM to encrypt the traffic between their uh, containers. Uh, I know that Midonet is using HTB. Uh, OVS has a variety of different ways to configure uh, the TCQ disks and so on uh, for, for quality of service. Uh, and we're also actually looking at for the uh, Open vSwitch user space to make use of the TC Flower hardware offloads uh, APIs. Um, so briefly, there's also a, a point around the sort of complexity. So, uh, and this is certainly true for the Open vSwitch daemon, where we have an OpenFlow API that provides uh, dozens of or hundreds of tables, uh, tens of thousands of priorities, and the number of flows that you can configure at this OpenFlow layer is is very large, and the the, the traffic may hit many many stages, many different tables, and. Uh, we don't actually want to execute all of that logic for a particular packet. So OVS compiles that logic down into basically what is a, is a single lookup in the uh, OVS uh, kernel API to, to reduce the, the, the per packet cost for actually executing that behavior. Uh, so in summary, uh, so SDN really has driven the uh, OpenVSwitch API uh, development around the uh, logically centralized packet forwarding behavior. 
Uh, I've described the obvious Netlink API, uh, and I, I believe that it provides some, some generally useful primitives. And, and one of the, the signs that it's useful is that it's not just the OVS user space that we provide uh, that is making use of this kernel API, but we can see there are other com community projects that are building on top of this and finding it useful. Um, OVS is built in a way that allows you to integrate with other kernel functionalities, such as NetFilter and, and QoS and so on. And finally, we were able to minimize the amount of code complexity that we put into the kernel uh, and put some of that complexity into the user space, uh, but still have that power uh, and that ability to forward traffic in the way that uh, the users are hoping to do. So what do you think? Hi. Uh, would it be possible to hook these uh, tables in already in like the XDP data path to do stuff like the DDoS protection that we heard about? Yeah, there's, uh, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't, couldn't do that. Um, you could, I, I could imagine a, a situation where you have some set of like DDoS uh, filters and so on existing in XDP, and maybe that's sort of like a first layer of protection, and then uh, when the traffic, when the XDP program does like XDP pass, it, it isn't able to filter that traffic. Then it proceeds up through the normal networking stack, and you could configure NetFilter, you could configure OVS, you can configure multiple different things together, and, and, and that would work great. Well, I agree that uh, Open vSwitch is a very powerful mechanism, and uh, there are various ways to configure it, to have a daemon up, up there, have people set it with static uh, rules and everything like that. But I think that the thing that's considered powerful, which is the arbitrary masking capability, is also its greatest weakness. Because uh, as I learned when removing the routing cache from the kernel, that uh, allowing traffic to determine population events is kind of dangerous, and in, in essence, denial is serviceable. So I think that's, that's always been a fundamental mm -hmm. issue I've seen with OpenSB Switch. Yeah, so, so actually, uh, that's a great point. And I think um, it's actually, it'll be interesting to see. I, I think there's, uh, there's some interest in being able to try to address that, that, that concern. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, if, if the traffic is causing up calls and, and populating this network socket and, and, and so on, maybe there's a way that we can rate limit that. Another or, thing or, or I've noticed when I look at the, the examples or actually real life scenarios, People don't use arbitrary mass, they use prefixes. Yeah, I mean, it depends and on... So if, if we formalize that, we could start using trees for the lookups and things like that instead of having this arbitrary prefix kind of situation, which is... Uh, that's why IPsec lookups, for example, are very complicated because they use arbitrary masking and things like this. So something to think about. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think, in some ways, I think that the flow allows... This, this arbitrary mask allows... Um, all that power and it allows the, the, the sorry the researchers to do some like crazy stuff, um, and it's sort of useful in, in some way for that. But then when you do start to look at implementing something that looks a lot more like a, a traditional network, you do end up with uh, you know your prefix lookups and so on. So no, makes sense. Makes sense. Any more questions? Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> um, thank you.